Good afternoon, uh, dear friends. It's nice to be here again, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to uh, deliver to you a, a paper uh, put together by our dear uh, Swedish friend Carl Eck, especially for this occasion. But first of all, uh, when Bianca mentioned to me this morning that she had to deal with a lot of Japanese words, I did not envy her. But after reading the paper of, uh, of Carl Eck, I can assure you that, uh, that though uh, our language, the English language and the Dutch language is pretty much related to the Scandinavian languages, uh, uh, it's quite a challenge uh, to pronounce uh, uh, names, uh, Swedish names of places and uh, persons. So first of all, let me apologize for any mispronunciations. Uh, there will certainly be. Okay. Uh, a short history on the Theosophical Center uh, on the Swedish island Visingsö and its Raja Yoga summer school. On the Gotlandian Lake Vettern, we find the long, narrow, and beautiful little island Visingsö. Gotland is a province in Sweden. Everybody knows where Sweden is on the map of Europe, somewhere in the north. This is the island. But Sweden. Uh, uh, and the Lake Vettern is, is about a two hours flight from Amsterdam to the north. Uh, and uh, uh, Gotland is a province of, uh, of Sweden. So here we are in the Lake Vettern and the uh, beautiful island Visingsö. You can see here, during historical times, the island was a center for both political and religious power in Sweden. And the island was also the place where Catherine Tingley, in the early years of the 20th century, planned to establish a second point Loma. According to an old local legend, the island was created by a giant named Vise. His wife was on the other side of the lake, as they always are, uh, and wanted to get across to join him. But the lake was too big uh, for one jump, to the other side, so she yelled to her husband uh, on the other side of the lake to throw, to throw a clump of earth uh, in the middle of the lake so she could uh, get across by stepping on it. So this was how, according to the local legend, the island was uh, made. It's quite a lump of earth you can see here. How long the island has been inhabited uh, is hard to say, but on it have been found many tombs and other evidence from the Stone Age. But it are the findings from the later Bronze Age which are the most interesting. Archaeology provides evidence that the island was a spiritual center. Ritual cult objects have been find, found, including a miniature sword, uh, that was worn and hung by a cord around the neck. The island can be considered to have had the same status in ancient times as Kinakule in Vestagötaland, that's another province of Sweden, and Upakra in Scania, that's the south of Sweden, I know. These were the places where the ancient people went to celebrate the feasts of the turning sun at the year's four sacred intersections. Dr. De Peruca writes in his book, The Four Sacred Seasons, and I think it's on our book table, isn't it, uh, Jarni? Uh, there are four turning points uh, of the year, the solstices of winter and summer, and the equinoxes of the spring and of the autumn. The cycle of the year among the ancient peoples was always, always considered to be a symbol of the life of man, or indeed, of the life of the universe. Birth at the winter solstice, the beginning of the year, adolescence trials and their conquest at the spring equinox, adulthood, full-blown strength and power at the summer solstice, representing a period of initiation when the great renunciation is made and then closing with the autumnal equinox, the period of the great passing. This cycle of the year likewise symbolizes the training in chelaship. Catherine Tingley often mentioned that on Fissingsø, in ancient times, there was a mystery school present, 
and, did, and that this was one of her reasons why she chose this island to build a mystery school of modern times. There were few who took her serious during her lifetime. However, research and excavations during the second half of the 20th century proved her to be right. Fizingzö, during the Bronze Age, was a spiritual center of great importance where there was established a solar cult with celebrations of the four turning points of the sun during the year, which are certainly the most important festivals of the year. The period of the ancient Scandinavian solar cult during the Bronze Age offers many exciting studies. For obvious reasons, it are the popular exoteric ones which are best known today. Unfortunately, the vast majority of Swedish archaeologists and historians of today lack the knowledge and understanding that there is also an esoteric side of the ancient religion. Furthermore, Visingsö lies in Götaland, whereas Swedish historical research for state centralist reasons is predominantly concentrated on the Stockholm area in Svealand. This is picture number two, is it? I, uh, well, here you can see the sun resting on a carriage pulled by a horse across the sky. Uh, from, from rock carvings, we know that the people of the Bronze Age solar cult celebrated the sun turning points with processions where a golden sun resting on a carriage was pulled by a horse, which obviously symbolized the sun traveling across the sky. On boats along the shores, there were festivals with acrobats and people uh, wearing beautiful designed sun symbols. Most names of their deities have been forgotten meanwhile, but one of the most significant survived into the Viking Age, namely the god Ul. The name means light, glory, and radiance, which indicates a clear link to the early, earlier sun cult. Picture number four, oh, there we have the acrobats. During the uh, 1100s and 1200s, Visingsö was a political center of power for the Swedish monarchy. On the island's southern tip, the castle Nes was built, which was the residence for many of the Swedish medieval kings. And during the 1600s, the region was ruled by the mighty Brahe family from the castle Visingsborg on the east side of the island. KT mentioned that she had a connection with Brahe in a previous incarnation, which might also have contributed to her choice for Wiesingsö. Worth mentioning is that Count Per Brahe established on the island an important school as well as a printing industry. The school was active until the early 1800s. KT felt from early beginnings a personal bond with Sweden, and in 1899 she received an invitation from Swedish theosophists to come to Sweden. The decision was quickly taken, and the same year she made her first trip to the country. During that visit, she also received an invitation from King Oscar II for an audience at his royal palace in Stockholm. The Swedish king was very interested in theosophy, esotericism, and the universal brotherhood, and himself the author of nine books on theosophy, whose manuscripts are still held under secrecy in the Bernadotte archives in Stockholm, for obvious reasons. Yeah. King Oscar's son, Duke Chao of Vestra Götaland, was deeply interested in theosophical, theosophical teachings as well, and appeared to be a secret member of the Universal Brotherhood. KT was well aware of the occult significance of Fissingsö, and in 1907 she began plans to establish a second point Loma on the island. On her visit to Sweden, 
the same year, she met again King Oscar on the 19th of September and found in him a strong supporter of the idea for a Raja Yoga school in Sweden. So with his help, she established a school for the revival of lost mysteries of antiquity in April 1896 and purchased land from the crown on the island for the establishment of the school at Stigby. And subsequently, a corporation was created as the official owner of the site under the name Swedish Westcott Company. And as its first director was appointed, uh, the editor, Mr. Thorsten Hetlund, uh, who was Dr. Gustav Zander's deputy as a head of the esoteric section in Sweden, and whose father uh, was a personal friend of Professor Victor Riedberg, who was instrumental for the foundation of the Theosophical, Theosophical Society in Sweden. The location on Visingsö became later known as the Temple Garden, the Temple Court. There was a small orthogonal shaped peace temple made of wood, which later was demolished. The name Temple Court, which still exists, refers to the large Greek temple that was built later in 1913. Six years passed by with not very much activity on Visingsö, and the project seemed to end up more as a second San Juan Hill, the smaller Raja Yoga School in Cuba, than a second Point Loma in California. But then unexpectedly, Katie announced she leased a part of the large crown forest on the island in order to start building a Raja Yoga school with similar activities as at Point Loma. Just as KT did at Point Loma and San Juan Hill, she erected a flagpole with the Loma Land flag on Visingsö. The employees were allowed to erect another flagpole for the Swedish flag and somehow this appeared to be a danger to local legends Per Brahe's old weather fane, which subsequent, subsequently was replaced by a huge stick, an unfortunate act which aroused some emotions among the islanders, and the spread of the rumor that the alien Tingley had desecrated a historical landmark. The local clergy, of the Lutheran State Church now saw their chance and took the opportunity to attack KT and the Theosophists. They organized a protest meeting on Visingsö, where it appeared many of the participants were coming from far away and were not at all the local islanders as they claimed to be. The Lutheran pastors argued that with the establishment of the Raja Yoga School, Theosophists would be in conflict with the law which stated that the education system in Sweden is under supervision and responsibility of the Swedish church. In their opinion, therefore, the school was pagan and such, of course, would be unacceptable for them. But they were wrong. Because for contemporary, uh, contemporary Swedish law did allow other schools, which were not under supervision of the church uh, of Sweden, under certain conditions, for instance, Jewish and Catholic schools, and a theosophical school would very well fall within the same category. The issue became later uh, a topic in many Swedish newspapers, and many, especially conservatives, but also some socialists, took a stand against KT and the school idea. There was support for the theosophists' cause all the time from the Gothenburgs, Handels or Schöfartiding, but that may be partially due to the fact that Thorsten Hetlund's cousin Henrik Hetlund was the then editor-in-chief. In the liberal newspaper, Simbrishams Bladet from Scania, which had a reporter on the spot, could be read in July 1913 that the Lutheran clergy during the meeting went as far as calling down the curse of God over these heathen theosophists. Where did we hear that before? <laughs> yeah. 
the world-renowned scholar of Japanese horticulture and professor of art history Oswald Siren, a leading man in the Swedish uh, Universal Brotherhood, organized a counter-meeting against the Lutherans, which turned out completely outnumbered uh, them. At that meeting, Professor Siren read a clarifying letter of protest where he said that no school would be built on the leased land, but on the land already owned by the organization. On the leased land, a temporary uh, amphitheater and an art gallery would be built for the occasion of the International Theosophical Peace Co Congress later that year. The conflict with the local clergy gradually ebbed away. The local vicar, who was interviewed later in June 1925 by the morning newspaper Skanska Dagbladet, ironically declared himself to be the loser by saying that his sermons were attended by maybe eight or ten people, half of which were asleep, while Mrs. Tingley's theosophical, theosophical lectures, which are held outdoors at Skunksgarden, were attended by hundreds. On March the 3rd, in 1913, KT formed the Parliament of Peace and Universal Brotherhood, and 10 days later she announced that during the upcoming Midsummer Weekend, an International Theosophical Peace Congress will be organized in Wiesingsö. The Congress was held from June the 22nd to June the 29th, with over 2,000 participants from many different countries. Most attendees obviously were Swedish theosophists, but also a large number of artists and musicians were present. The entire event had a very artistic touch. Historians up to the present day want us to believe that it were uh, predominantly Lomaland artists for this artistic character of the Congress. True it is that there were many of them attending and participating in the work at exhibitions, including at the Greek temple. But it is also true that many major Swedish artists participated both at the Congress and at the exhibitions. We have another picture here. See what that is? Well, that's the Peace Temple. Okay. That okay. So you've seen the Peace Temple from the front and from the side, I think. Here we go. As it is now, obviously. Part of an art exhibition, I believe, on the island. So one of the Swedish artists who particularly needs to be highlighted here is uh, Sven Bengtsson. He came from the island Lund and met during the 1880s the Countess Constant Wachtmeister, who was then living on the island. Bengtsson very early became interested in theosophy and founded in 1891 a lodge of the society on Lund. It was to him that the Countess Wachtmeister turned to for the manufacturing of the burial urn where H.P. Blavatsky cremated remains were placed in. The urn was cast in copper and crowned with a golden lotus flower and is now at Atyar. There are also two other simpler urns containing ashes from, uh, from HPB uh, at the Theosophical Centers in London and New York, uh, which are also signed by Sven Bengtsson. Several major Swedish artists were member of Bengtsson's Lodge in Lund, and they attended, without doubt, the Congress. Among them, Frederick Krebs, Preben uh, Nördernan, Henrik Sjöström, and Hans Erlandsson. Frederick Krebs is known in Swedish art history as an altar painter. He painted the Indian gods in Scanian rural churches. Other artists present were Anders Zorn, Carl Larsson, and Millis. 
The Congress was an attempt of KT to promote and stimulate the idea of peace, friendship, and respect among people and nations, which values were of particular importance in those troubled times shortly before the First, first World War. The week-long program was covered with speeches, lectures, music and drama performances, and parades, in addition to those already mentioned art exhibitions. Telegrams of congratulations were received from many peace organizations worldwide, which was a result of Katie's successful marketing propaganda. This is picture number seven, isn't it? This is number eight. But this, show, this shows, I think, uh, many people attending the Peace Congress at the time. Gives you an idea what it was. KT had invited 24 students from the Raja Yoga College at Point Loma who would be responsible for your musical arrangements and perform chamber music, and who would stay at the island after the Congress as teachers at the school. The Raja Yoga Choir also performed at Visingsoe and had on his program three new songs composed on the island by Raja Yoga student Rex Dunn with text from Kenneth Morris. These three songs were repeated at the end of the first session of the 20th World Peace Congress in The Hague in the Netherlands later the same year. KT had the habit to announce major projects at a very short notice. The Peace Congress at Wissingsö was announced just three months before the actual date, which caused friction between KT and the leadership of the uh, Universal Brotherhood Swedish section. Its president, Dr. Gustav Zander, argued in harsh terms, he was one of the few who could and dared to go against KT, that KT was demanding too much from the Swedish theosophists, and if she did not send help to them, he would take his hands away from the entire project. In a letter he wrote, uh, he mentioned that she was not dealing with the Point Loma full-time available co-workers this time, uh, and that the already hard-working Swedish theosophists actually had a normal daily job uh, besides their theosophical work to look after. The help that was needed eventually, of course, came, and the Peace Congress was a big success. The Raja Yoga School now on Visingsö was officially inaugurated on June 24, 1913 by KT. At the opening ceremony, a cornerstone was unveiled with the inscription. We have the cornerstone, I believe, so yeah. It's the Swedish, is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it mentioned uh, visiting the Raja Yoga School for higher upbringing of the youth. The cornerstone was laid on 24th June 1913 by a KT uh, official as official head of the Universal Brotherhood and the Theosophical Society worldwide. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's and William Kwan Judge successor uh, at the international headquarters of the organization in Point Loma. The laying of the stone was framed at a pompous ceremony created by KT herself for the occasion. The actual opening of the school was delayed by the Great War, but also because the facility was not ready yet to receive students. KT returned to Sweden in 1922-23 with the idea to open, to start with the opening of the school, with the registration uh, for students, but opposition of the Swedish church, the authorities, and the smear campaign inspired by some Swedish Aja theosophists preventing her from implementing it as planned. In 1924, she launched the modified plan, which meant that the Visingsö Raja Yoga School would start as a summer school only. 
the exhibition gallery, the ancient Greek temple from 1913, were rebuilt to serve as classrooms, and a new flagpole was erected outside, which KT said was the highest in Sweden. In the summer of 1924, the first classes started with about 50 pupils, aged between 3 and 16. The curriculum was the same as the Point Loma Raja Yoga School, with an emphasis put on music, language, art and drama. The teaching staff consisted of Swedish theosophists, some of whom served or had served at Point Loma. During the summer, there were also events for adult Swedish theosophists, which were very well attended. In 1928, a for the time very large sum of 300,000 Swedish kroner, was collected for the construction of two large new buildings. These would provide housing for another 200 prospective students. KT's death, however, in the following year, on July the 11th, put an end to these plans. She died as a result of complications from a car accident she suffered in Germany on the 31st of May during a lecture tour through Europe. And according to her own wish, she was immediately brought to Wissingse, where she died later on. KT was cremated just days after she passed away in Jönköping, and the ashes were put in two urns. One was sent to Point Loma and placed there. The other one was placed in Wissingse in the presence of, among others, Iverson Harris Jr. and the brothers Sven and Lars Eek. The location of the urn in Wissingsö was kept secret and has since not been revealed. The location was passed on orally to a small number of Swedish theosophists, some of them now alive, I assume. The regular summer gatherings and the school continued until 1937 and after that year sporadically until the mid-1950s, when an order from the Pasadena Theosophical Society forced the school to close and the Swedish section had to sell the entire facility. The summer activities on Visingö were very important for the Swedish section of the society and largely kept the organization vibrant and active. The departure from the island was the start of the decline of the Theosophical Society in Sweden. Picture number nine. Okay. No, no, the previous one. Here you can see, most of you will probably recognize Dr. de Peruca. And the other. Mr. Fuzel and Elsie Savage on the island on Wissingsö in August 1931. Okay. After the closure, the grounds were divided up. Parts of the buildings were demolished and others are private residences today. A number of the buildings were taken over by the Wissingsö Museum including the Greek temple, which was moved to its current location in Cebu. It is now an exhibition hall in Wissingsö and part of the temple garden created by the artist Ole Krant, which is used for conferences, weddings, <coughs> private parties and more. If you look for it, you'll find them on the internet. Uh, at the days of the summer school, students made their own clothing which they used at the performances of mystery plays. When they were worn out, they were collected as curiosities by the local Wissingsö women. In many homes today on the island, you may still find these costumes, and the local museum has about 60 of them on display. KT was also the one who introduced electricity for the first time from the mainland to Wissingsö. Didn't she do the same thing here in Point Loma? I think so, yes, yeah. For this and other contributions to the island, she is very well respected now. Actually, one of the ferries between Grana and Wissingsö carries her name. 
We have that picture, there we are. Madame Tingley. Getting a lot of attention. Yeah. The ship was built in 1970 for the Waxholms Bolaget as the motor ship Nordan, which sold it to the municipality of John Chopping in 1992, which then changed the name to Madame Tingley, as you have noticed here. In the summer of 2013, so next year, Madame Tingley will be taken out of service, and whether the new ferry will also be named after Katie is today unknown, but I understand the ship is for sale, so... <laughs> In this area, I think it's a very attractive, yeah. <laughs> seaworthy vessel, yeah? The legacy of the Visingsö Raja Yoga School is still very much alive today and guided tours for people interested in theosophy and its activities on the island are available daily during the summer month. The Raja Yoga project did perhaps not turn out to be as what KT wanted initially and planned to be, but visiting Visingsö now in the year 2012 without hearing stories about the fabulous Madame Tingley as the official tourist guides uh, call her, and about theosophy is not possible. And uh, I would like to end with a, with a quote from uh, Catherine Tingley's uh, Path of the Mystic, where she, and this is the quote, where she says, what I wanted to do was to prevent the damage being done. The world was already fairly well equipped with havens for the beaten and the fallen. I wanted to evolve an institution that would take humanity in hand before it was worst in the struggle of life. Thank you very much. Yeah. A question, please. What a beautiful and sad story. You said something about, uh, was it King uh, Oscar? Yes. That he wrote seven or 12 different yeah. books or something and these are hidden away and you said for good reason, I don't understand. Is this working, yeah? Um, so I've corresponded for a few years with Carl Eck, who wrote this paper and presentation for us. So the issue in Sweden is, even today, is that uh, the king is the head of the Lutheran church in Sweden. I think it's maybe a little different in, same in Holland or Germany? Same. Okay. So this is 1913 and earlier, of course, where Sweden is completely Lutheran. And even today, uh, you'd have to say Sweden is more Lutheran perhaps than some of the other Northern European countries. For example, uh, well, there's a visitor recently who explained it to me, uh, doing a study on theosophy there. But he said that, like even himself or his parents, who, you know, his mother may go to church once a year, but everyone is baptized and is quote-unquote Lutheran even today, almost everyone, even if you don't go to church. So it's a much stronger form there uh, in terms of the cultural context of Lutheranism. I was kind of surprised given Swedish progressiveness in one direction. So at the time of King Oscar and even today, uh, and according to Carl Eck, the, the books, he, he actually has been and actually was allowed to see them. In, this is the royal uh, archive where they're locked away. And he said they're extraordinary books, not, not just some, you know, I mean, it's nice to have some good books on theosophy, but he said these are really quite extraordinary writings by a very deep, someone with very deep understanding. And uh, they simply cannot allow that someone with that kind of uh, position in history to, to be associated with those writings at this point still. 
it's possible at some point in the future that will change. And part of the reflection of that, I was just going to add also is uh, also from my uh, my cousin was telling me my uh, cousin being Swedish, you know, from my mother's side uh, a couple of years ago was that King Oscar is extremely important in in the history of Northern Europe because prior to I don't know the exact date, someone else may know here, but about uh, maybe 1910, 11 or 12, shortly before he died. Sweden and Norway were one country. Uh, Sweden had dominated Norway as, and, and parts of Finland and other areas, but still had kept Norway as a kind of um, colony, in a sense. Yep, that's right. And uh, King Oscar went against the majority and the conservatives of his country and com undid that. He set Norway free, basically. And I think, I mean, I could imagine this. I don't know if it can be proven, but it, certainly it's theosophical influences in himself that moved him in that direction. And as my uh, cousin also informed me, he said, and how important that was for us as Swedes during World War II when Germany controlled Norway. Uh, if we had still been one country, Germany would have controlled the whole, the whole area, which would not have been a good thing at that time. You know, there were implications around that many, in many directions. I don't know if I'm going off too far, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ken. That helped educate me quite a bit. I'm very ignorant on this. Uh, I still am very shocked that the Swedish would not allow a certain set of writings to be published. I mean, again, they're very progressive in many ways, but this is extremely conservative to me. I'm, I'm shocked. Are they preserved? Are they transcribed? Or are they just old, crumbling, handwritten manuscripts? Uh, I don't know the details. I would imagine the Royal Archives are kept with extreme care. A and at least they're still there. And given the right connections, you know, again, uh, Carl Eck was able to see them and actually read, read them. He thinks at some point, perhaps in the not so distant future, uh, he was given the impression that they may allow publication The same uh, situation happens in the Netherlands. The queen is head of the church. Although her mother was used to have theosophical lectures, uh, lectures on the palace, it was official, never, never published. And records of the meetings were also never published. Still there are in the archive. But you have to realize if a queen in that position starts to say that she be, is more in theosophist than something, in our case, a Protestant, and so on. That means for the whole uh, church organizations in the country and all the belonging people, a shock, a real shock. And that, I think, was in Sweden the same. Eh? If you are in Sweden, and we have been many times in Sweden and Norway, there are absolute liberal countries, but to make an official statement that they prefer theosophy above, uh, let's say, the Lutheran uh, religion is quite something. Yeah? And you have also to realize, especially in that country, that that religion is so fixed in their system that if you look to political parties, there are no political parties with a religion issue in it. Because everybody is Lutheran. There is no need for it. That is fixed. So there is no discussion about it. Yeah? So that gives a complete different situation in the counties. Although there are liberal and special Sweden is very liberal and you don't feel any restriction in thinking and philosophy and religion at all. But making it an official statement is something much more. Okay. Thank you. You okay? I thought I heard something for the first time, I didn't know. Did I hear well, Ken, that Catherine Tingley started with Wiesingse from New York and after that uh, started Punt Loma here? I heard 1896, the Wiesingse start. Did I hear that well? 
Um, no, I think her, she may have stopped in Sweden on the 1896 or 7 journey around the world, but I'm not sure about that. Quite honestly, I would have to check, double check. I don't remember that being in the paper, but I read it very quickly. It's, uh, you know, certainly, you know, her, her, even her first encounter in Cuba is early, before Point Loma. She's headed to Point Loma. So everything comes to um, manifestation, in a sense, very rapidly with Catherine Tingley, to say the least, yeah. It's so uh, that even though this... Uh the Raja Yoga School did not go forth, but she planned a seed in the near future that it might start there again? Yeah, certainly. Certainly, and even the, uh, you know, we see these, uh, uh, well, they're, they're, we can almost see them as quaint or amusing, except that those conflicts, uh, as mentioned here earlier, like with the clergy on the island or in here in San Diego, for example, the early 1900, the, the local Christian churches uh, uh, attacked Point Loma and Catherine Tingley very strongly. Now here in Point Loma, she had enough uh, presence and enough uh, energy to challenge them to debate. And of course, then they quickly refused as soon as they realized that they would be trying to debate Christianity with uh, some of the scholars at Point Loma. So Tingley, undaunted in that case, uh, simply had the debate anyway and would have different people take the different perspectives. And after that, she had no problem uh, in that particular area here. Um, but these debates that kind of break up the um, crystallized thinking of different areas and places, of course, these conflicts continue all over. Uh, especially recently in this country, we have actually more lately, uh, I think. Uh, but all that's actually very positive in the sense that it's moving, moving new ideas into being. So even though on one level you can say, oh, this didn't work at Vising Sir, it actually um, broke open society in a very li big way, you know. And there are many details off of this, many, you know, uh, as can be seen in the presentation, uh, the people supporting theosophy in Sweden at the time were, a number of them were highly influential, you know, like the newspaper editor and uh, Torsten Hedlund and others were very influential people. Oswald Soren was a, a curator of the museum in Stockholm and a professor of Asian art and history, you know, world renowned. So all these people had a lot of influence, so things uh, which brought other changes, certainly, as we see today in the openness of the world religious traditions throughout the world, et cetera. Yeah, the question is, um, with her work and the other two women, Alice Bailey and the others that were to bring this education to humanity, uh, what schools are there in the world today, private or public, that are teaching with this in mind, given if you study vocabulary, root cause words are all related to the scri holy scriptures and they're all related to the um, apparatus of mankind. If, if vocabulary is rooted in it, there and we're not teaching that today, how come? And then in each cultural tradition, given their vocabulary, picking up the pieces where they left off by relating the two together to continue on with that knowledge, is, is there any efforts being done along those lines today? to ground it in real education places. Uh, it's, I'm actually uh, uh, doing, pre presenting a s short paper at the coming ITC conference, uh, which takes uh, educational ideas from a very short part of the Key to Theosophy by Blavatsky. And then I follow out the lines in different theosophical um, lineages, we could call them, where theosophical ideas took root. So those, those areas are in the educational work of Maria Montessori, in the educational work of Rudolf Steiner in the Waldorf schools, in the educational school of uh, 
J. Krishnamurti. Uh, so in addition to the Rajiga School at, at Point Loma and Catherine Tingley. So really, if you come down to the essentials in each of these four uh, strands, you could call them, which uh, have a core commonality to them, there's a, a more a great deal in common. And these educational ideas not only have pervaded their own educational areas, but beyond that into affecting other educational systems, you know. It's a very big subject. In addition, there's a school today in the Philippines, uh, Vikao Chin, uh, what's the name of it? Golden Link, yeah, Golden Link School. It's a theosophical school in the Philippines yes. for, uh, through high school now, yeah? So, again, in that school, I think he's synthesizing from all of these different educational systems found in these differing theosophical uh, avenues. That's a short answer to your uh, very big question. Well, I could say that the same in, in the Netherlands. Uh, we have quite an, uh, a number of very good institutes, and what you see is exactly what Ken uh, called synthesize. They take uh, the good uh, things from that type of schools, uh, bring it together, give it a new name, and um, they give the, uh, an education in that direction. And in general, you can say the good schools take over much more the experience and the technique what you can see in the Raja Yoga school nowadays. Yep. Yeah, some don't realize Matasori is, is completely rooted in theosophy, historically. She, she got stuck in India because she was Italian during World War II, for example, and the, she was hosted and lived at Adyar during that time and wrote probably one of her most important books in terms of the philosophy of her system called The Absorbent Mind, which is uh, really quite excellent. Maybe it is time for a uh, five minutes break before we uh, start to jump in another uh, type of uh, direction of theosophy.